Fire Emblem Three Houses is a recently released tactical RPG for the Nintendo Switch, wherein you take on the role of a professor at a military academy. From that position, you have the ability to train and guide your students' education, and by extension, roll in battle, in any way you'd like. Yes, any way you'd like. Say, for example, I want to specialize, and instead of being a general instructor that helps to guide each student down a unique path custom-tailored toward enhancing and utilizing their natural talents, I want to be the axe teacher, teaching all my students the way of the axe whether they like it or not. I can do that. Is it a terrible idea? Probably. But who's gonna stop me? I've got tenure. So join me for this experiment. As we discover together, is it possible to beat Fire Emblem Three Houses while only using axes? Before we get started, we need to lay down the rules, and what I'm going to be pegging my rules to is the primary equipment slot, the inventory slot that weapons and magic get equipped to when you attack with them, or equip them. Our rule is as follows, if it gets equipped to the primary equipment slot when we use it, and it isn't an axe, then we are not allowed to use it. That means we obviously can't use any swords, lances, bows, or gauntlets. I'm also including unarmed attacks that the fighter classes can use as gauntlets for the purpose of this challenge, since while it's not a weapon per se, it is equipped to the primary slot and isn't an axe, so we can't use it. Under these rules, we also can't use any offensive magic. When initially planning for this challenge, I thought that assist magic like heal, physic, or warp would have been allowed since you don't normally equip them to your primary slot when you use them, but as it turns out, you can equip them to your primary slot, which means we can't use them either. As for things we actually are allowed to use, they include axes, obviously, and by axes I mean anything the game mechanically considers as an axe. Included in that would of course be things like iron axes, silver axes, training axes, but also maces and hammers, which are classified as axes in the game. We also have no qualms about equipping things in our secondary equipment slots, so we can still use things like shields or rings. In addition, Consumable items like vulneraries or antidotes are legal to use in this challenge. Also, actions like rally and dance don't rely on the primary equipment slot, so they are perfectly fine to use. And finally, battalions and the gambits they supply are not equipped to the primary equipment slot, and therefore can be used to their full extent. With all that established, let's start the game. We'll be playing on hard difficulty in classic mode. Now, some of you may be ready to comment, Wow, what a wimp! He calls this a challenge video, but isn't even playing on maddening difficulty. A total fraud. In my defense, I will say that I may have considered playing on maddening difficulty if it existed when I started this challenge. <laughs> Maybe next time. For now, though, we have other highly important decisions to make, namely female, Byleth, and the 17th day of the Harp String Moon. Like I said, very important decisions. With those decisions behind us, it's time for our first battle. Already things are a bit, uh, interesting. We have control over four units for this battle, and among them, only one wields an axe. So we take the only logical course of action. We send Edelgard up north into the forest to face the bandits, while everyone else goes and hides at a corner. 
by intelligently positioning Edelgard on the edges of the forest, and with some liberal use of smash, Edelgard can successfully solo all the bandits. Gerald does come up and offer some help later on, and while he does use a lance, he isn't one of my units. He's an allied unit, so his actions don't affect our challenge. With the bandits defeated, we now have an actually important choice to make. The choice, in fact. Which house will we choose? It's a choice that's been contextualized in many ways. Black Eagles, Blue Lions, or Golden Deer. Edelgard, Dimitri, or Claude. Red, Blue, or Yellow. Valor, Mystic, or Instinct, Adrestia, Fargus, or Lester. The correct one, or the other two. But for us today, the choice comes down to this. All three houses have units that can wield axes effectively, and units that aren't naturally great at using axes. But only one has an effective axe wielder that we've already leveled up to level 3. So today, we'll be picking the Black Eagles. From there, it's not long before we're thrust into the mock battle. Unfortunately, we do encounter a uh, slight issue when preparing for this battle. You typically field five units for this battle, but we only own three axes. And before you suggest that buying more would solve the problem, the marketplace isn't available to us yet, so we can't. <laughs> What we can do is make liberal use of trading items between units. Would it be better to have an axe for each unit? Yes, but this does help mitigate the issue significantly. Now for the strategy I employed for this battle, we open by dealing with the three closest units, Lorenz, Ash, and Ignatz. With the battle being 5 on 3, coming out of the skirmish on top is quite doable so long as we avoid attracting the attention of any other units. With those three defeated, our next move is to head west and take on the rest of the Golden Deer House. However, it didn't strike me as a good idea to engage them on their terms at the fortified position they had taken up in the woods. Instead, I sent Edelgard around their western flank in attempt to bait them away from their advantageous position. It worked like a charm, bringing Claude and Hilda right into my trap, where we made short work of them, as well as Manuela, who we confronted later on on her own. With the Golden Deer entirely removed from the battle, it was not long before we were set upon by the Blue Lions. In response, we took defensive positions both in the forest and heel tile, which the Golden Deer had been using previously. The Blue Lions foolishly opted to attack the heel tile where I had stationed Edelgard and Petra. Ultimately, this led to Edelgard smashing Dimitri and Tadu, while Mercedes took several ultimately ineffective shots at Petra. With the students subdued, only Professor Hanneman remained, who was no match for the five of us. And thus, we won the battle. With our first major battle behind us, it became time to perform some more administrative tasks. First on the list, buying about as many axes as we possibly can. In an ideal world, I'd like to outfit each student with at least a training axe and an iron axe. We do manage to purchase everyone at least one of those two things, as well as a single hand axe. I figured it would be a good idea to have at least some ranged capabilities available to us. It's probably about time we address teaching as well. It should come as no surprise that every one of my students is getting taught the axe skill with the short-term goal for all of them being to certify in the fighter class. In the long term, however, their educational paths will diverge due to the fact that there is a huge variety of classes later in the game that make use of axes. For infantry, there's the brigand and warrior classes. Add a bit of flying into the mix and you get the wyvern rider and wyvern lord classes. Opt instead for heavy armor and you can certify in the armored knight and fortress knight classes. There's even a cavalry class suited for axe-wielding units later on in the game, in the form of the Great Knight. It'll be a while before we can certify as any of those, but nevertheless our preparation for them starts now. In addition to learning the axe skill, Edelgard, Ferdinand, and Dorothea will be learning the heavy armor skill. The secondary skill that Bernadetta and Petra will be learning is flying. 
Hubert and Linhart will be learning authority in addition to axes. I'm letting Caspar learn brawling as his secondary skill. I know he's not going to ever actually use gauntlets, but I figure he might be able to become a war master in the late game if he learns brawling. As for myself, I'm going to try picking up axes, flying, and authority. Battle is literally the only thing we can do on the 18th, so we take on an auxiliary battle. My strategy for this battle was to split into three main groups. To the north, I sent Dorothea, Hubert, and Byleth to deal with a small group of enemies. To the south, I sent Ferdinand, Bernadetta, Petra, and Linhart, with the logic that these weaker units could prevail against the foes in the south with a numbers advantage and the cover of the forest. Finally, I had Edelgard and Kaspar take up a more central position in the forest, from which they could hopefully lend support to either of the other two groups should they become overwhelmed, as well as act as the first line of defense in case the main force of the opposing army started advancing. While of course needed to adapt a bit over the course of the battle, the general strategy remained intact. As a side note, I'm probably making some of these upcoming early game battles a bit more difficult for myself than they necessarily have to be by intentionally trying to make significant use of my underleveled units, so they can hopefully catch up and not remain underleveled units. Because let me tell you, right now Edelgard is very powerful compared to the units we're going up against and could probably solve a lot of our problems. But like I said, I think it's important in the long term that we don't let our other units lag behind too much. Before the main battle of the month, some important educational milestones are reached. The students are starting to level up the axe skill, thus giving them access to axe prowess level 1 and the smash combat art, which I should note up to this point only Kaspar and Edelgard had access to and the lack of which is a big reason as to why the other students have been fairly weak up to this point. Also, Edelgard, who is level 6 at this point, has certified in the fighter class. I also bought some more iron axes, hand axes, and a mace, as well as a lot of vulneraries, which are basically our only form of healing right now. Now on to the next battle. The overall strategy I used isn't all that interesting, it's just more or less what the game expects you to do. Advance down the first bridge, clear the area, then split the army and join back up to attack Gostas from both sides. The more interesting challenge was in the turn to turn tactics, trying to keep everyone alive while also attempting to direct as much experience as possible to some units that were still at level 1. <laughs> many of which still don't have access to Smash yet, which is a bit of a game changer at this point in the game, since it increases attack might and hit chance. Uh, sure, you can't get a follow-up attack while using it, but Edelgard is the only unit consistently getting follow-up attacks right now anyway, and most everyone else's might and hit chance leave a lot to be desired right now. Despite my efforts, however, we did need to rely on Edelgard to bail us out of a few tough spots. While we do come out of this battle victorious, we also come out of it with a level 7 Edelgard and about half the army only at level 2. As we go through chapters 3 and 4, we try our best to address that issue. And we did so fairly effectively in my opinion. Outside of the typical difficulty associated with focusing on leveling up underleveled characters, chapters 3 and 4 don't give us much trouble. We even get our hands on the Sword of the Creator without much difficulty. The Sword of the Creator. We can't use it, so uh, off to the convoy with it. By the time we get to the main mission of chapter 5, everyone is using the fighter class and at about level 9 or higher including a new addition to the house, Sylvain, who I'm having learn axe and flying. As for the mission itself, it got a bit interesting, and forgive me, but I can't recall if this always happens or if I experienced a rare, unlucky occurrence, but my ally for this battle seemed to have early on in the fight attracted the aggro of nearly every enemy on the map. That turned out to be quite a predicament, but by keeping a cool head and falling back to buy time for the rest of my, at that point, divided army to rejoin the main group before striking, we made it through. 
As a side note, I have found out by this point in the game that standing next to Dorothea is actually one of our better means of healing right now. Anyways, with the main mission of Chapter 5 clear, we can move on, but not before going out of our way to claim ownership of the Lance of Ruin. The, uh, Lance of Ruin. We can't use this, and I honestly don't know why I went out of my way to obtain it. But, uh, here we are, so, uh, to the convoy with it! In Chapter 6, we do take on some auxiliary battles, and quest battles, but none of them are of much note. By the time we get to the main mission, Bylas, Petra, Kaspar, and Linhart are all using the Brigand class, while Edelgard and Dorothea have certified in and are acting as Armored Knights. Speaking of Edelgard, she's still one of my more powerful units, and as such, her forced absence in this battle is a bit of a blow to our whole squad. To tackle this battle, I divided my army into two main forces, the first, spearheaded by Dorothea, would advance down the corridors on the eastern side of the map, which were patrolled by numerous archers, which proved to be highly ineffective against Dorothea's heavy armor, and thus that front proved to be mostly successful. Meanwhile, Byleth and anyone who wasn't with Dorothea set out on an offensive through the western side of the map which went smoothly until the area where the western chambers connect to the central chambers, where a bunch of problematic magic users forced us to retreat to a defensible room with a heel tile. From here, we were able to fight back and turn things back around into an offensive advance, thanks in no small part to Byleth being particularly adept at shrugging off the magical attacks. But ultimately, even without perhaps our best unit, we still made it through this mission and came out victorious. Chapter 7's main battle is the Battle of the Eagle and Lion. But before we tackle that, I'm sure you're all dying to see how the education is going. Oh yeah, we've uh, recruited Flane and Shamir now who are learning just axes and authority in addition to axes, respectively. As for the battle itself, this proved to be a tougher one. Whatever high-level strategies I had envisioned at the outset of the battle were quickly muddled in a messy skirmish for control over the center of the map. This struggle actually proved to be the most difficult I had faced yet, due in large part to Hilda being a very powerful unit that also happened to counter Edelgard, my most powerful unit, quite effectively. So like I said, the struggle was messy, to the point that Bernadetta ended up falling in battle. Luckily, units that fall in this battle don't die. After securing the center, we advanced west with the majority of our forces, where Felix with the Axe Breaker ability proved to be a tough obstacle. Though with the use of Gambit, still certainly manageable. While that was going down, I sent my armored units east to face the, at this point, very archer-heavy remnants of the Golden Deer, who we made short work of. With Chapter 7 finished, we're over halfway through the school year, and to be honest, the rest of the school year goes by quite smoothly. A few paralogues were a bit of trouble, but that was mostly due to me bringing underleveled units to the fights. The main exception to that assertion is Tales of the Red Canyon, which in retrospect I think I may have been playing just entirely wrong. You're not supposed to engage these birds on like turn 3, are you? Because um, that's what I did. It worked out in the end, but still. Anyway, over the course of the rest of the year I managed to recruit Hanuman, Manuela, Ingrid, Alois, and Ignatz. From an education perspective, we've managed to get everyone's skills up to as is being shown. Uh, as far as classes go, the biggest change has been a large influx of flying classes, with Byleth, Sylvain, and Bernadetta having certified as Wyvern Riders, and Ingrid has been using the Pegasus Knight class that she was already certified in when I recruited her. Aside from that, everyone's just been kind of promoting down the Axe Classes line, at this point, I think most of the original students are brigands. Hubert's a certified dancer, by the way. Although, right now he's trying to achieve class mastery as a brigand, 
Oh, and uh, Ferdinand is an armored knight now. And one last thing, I somehow haven't mentioned the saint statues yet. I've been putting basically all of my renown into the Saint Keel statue. It gives us axe bonuses, so it was kind of a no-brainer. Alright, school's over, we're taking the Crimson Fly route, and it's time for Chapter 12. It's generally pretty challenging, no real standard moment or obstacle. Though I will say, I've learned two valuable lessons. Firstly, flying units mobility is very useful, and secondly, Linhart is useless. Chapter 13 ended up being quite the challenge. This was due to two main factors. The first of which was the fact that I brought a severely underleveled Hanuman to the battle, and keeping him alive through the whole thing was honestly probably more hassle than it was worth. Nevertheless, keep him alive I did. My second issue was that I did not anticipate nor was I prepared for the enemy's retreat. I've played through Crimson Fire before, but I guess I achieved the objective back then, before the enemy had a chance to start retreating. This really left me scrambling. Luckily, Hubert was leading a battalion of Gautier knights, whose gambit was Stride, which allowed Edelgard enough movement to catch up with and subdue the retreating general and Honestly, I don't know what I could have done as a plan B from there, so uh, good thing it worked. Skipping ahead to chapter 15, Stride ended up being incredibly useful once again, especially when combined with the already great mobility of Wyvern Riders. Again, not an easy victory, but with a bit of thinking is certainly a possible one. Wyvern Riders ended up being very good for chapter 16, which honestly didn't end up being all too difficult. Now for one last look at education and classes, which of course is a very important part of the game. You should be able to see the skills on screen now. As for the classes, it's really more evolution than revolution. We've got Wyvern Riders now certified as Wyvern Lords, including Petra, who has finally joined the ranks of the Wyvern Corps. She would have joined sooner, but I had to get Bernadetta's authority high enough so she could lead a higher level flying battalion, which would then, in turn, free up a flying battalion for Petra to use. Other than that, Ferdinand is now a great knight. Hubert has fully embraced his identity as a dancer, and some of my brigands are warriors now. No war masters, though, unfortunately. But that's enough of that. It's time for battle. My approach to Chapter 17 ended up being, uh, employing the primary strategy of using literally the entire army attacking to bring a lot of demonic beasts down as quickly as possible. I actually almost prefer fighting giant monsters as they're pretty easy to bait into attacking who you want them to. I don't quite know how I managed it, but the enemy reinforcements didn't arrive until nearly the entire army was already defeated then retreated much more quickly than they came, after I personally flew over a river and defeated their commander. So overall, an interesting battle, but far from super difficult. Which brings us to the end of our journey. The final chapter, if you will. It takes place in a burning city, which is honestly a great battlefield for us, since our army, at this point, leverages flying units to a significant degree. It felt like there was more fire on the east side of the city, so I had my flying units advance that way, with everyone else advancing up the eastern center. Along the way, we ran into a few tough scrapes, like this one time Shamir was nearly killed by an ambush of Pegasus Knights, but in those moments, we were continually saved by the amazing mobility of Wyvern Lords. Now, Pegasus ambushes may have been annoying, but the real trouble came from the named units on the map. Cyril especially. He hits hard, and being a wyvern lord has amazing mobility. A taste of my own medicine, I suppose. Ultimately, Byleth and Edelgard ended up taking him out with the help of Hubert's dancing. From another named unit, we got Thunderbrand, a really cool sword. And therefore, something we can't use. To the convoy with it. With the named characters out of the way, all that remains is defeating a giant monster. This is the biggest, 
baddest monster of them all. But we've fought a lot of monsters by now, so I think I know what I'm doing. And as it turns out, I do. The monster slain, and now the battle, game, and challenge is over. So, is it possible to beat Fire Emblem Three Houses while only using axes? Yes. It is possible to beat Fire Emblem Three Houses while only using axes. The start had me a bit worried. But once we got into the mid-game, it became clear that the only thing that might stop us would be our own incompetence. And luckily, that didn't happen. Would I recommend you try this challenge for yourself? Uh, I honestly don't know. I enjoyed my time with it, and it certainly felt different to me compared to my regular playthrough of Fire Emblem Three Houses. But seeing as I hadn't played on hard mode prior to playing this challenge, I'm not actually sure how much of a difference Axe only made on the difficulty of the game, or how it would have gone in a different house for that matter. That's a lot of things that after 65 hours I still don't know about this challenge. So, you know what? If you're curious, go for it. It's a good time the whole way through. Which isn't something I can say about every challenge I've done. Speaking of which, I've done some other challenges, each of which have their own videos similar to this. So if you've watched this far into this one, you may want to like it, but uh, you may also want to check out some of the others. And of course, subscribe and ring the bell so you can be notified of future videos. And as always, if you've got an idea for a challenge I should attempt in the future, leave a comment. I'll be sure to read it. But anyways guys, until next time, I've been Seamacraft, and I'll catch you in the next challenge we try to mine some entertainment out of. Goodbye.